My name is Elizabeth Goff, and I've been asked by the AMHA to come with my coach, Tony Sandoval, to talk to you about some steps for successful outcomes. And for me, as a lifelong equestrian, I think there are a number of things that have great and oftentimes equal importance. Tony's going to talk about the physical aspects of training uh, your body like a, hor a horse trainer trains a horse, and why that's so important when you are competing. So there's, there's a couple of concepts that I'm gonna talk about today. Love, devotion, sacrifice, commitment, time, energy, and I have had the great fortune to achieve a lot of things, but I certainly didn't start at the top. So I'm going to show you a little video about where I came from. From where I came from and where I am now.
none of these accomplishments would have been possible without deep love for the horse. And that's, to me, the single most important thing about any success in life is loving what you do. Love is actually an action word. It's about dedication to something, devotion to something, and sacrifice sometimes. Not always easy, but if you love something enough, you become very willing to take those actions. But if, it's, if it has an underlying love to it, it's just so much easier. So we all have hopes, dreams, and wishes. But wishes are informative, but they're not transformative. So how do you get to where you want to go? And sometimes you may have a goal that's something as simple as not missing your second canter lead or moving from walk and trot to walk, trot, and canter. So the first step in that is making a commitment. And that is putting in the energy and the time <coughs> to make those progressive goals. If you have a goal of being able to ride in the Park Saddle Stake or the Hunter Stake or win at the Academy Finals and you're still in walk and trot, you need to have progressive goals. And you can work those out with your trainer and your physical trainer to come up with milestones to help you get there. The other thing is, for me, the reason I'm still in this, my goal, yes, I want to win, that's never my goal. My goal is to get better and take information. A lot of times we label things as bad or good, but really what it is is information. So you have an opportunity every time you ride and every time you show to learn something. And how you react to it is really the key and has been for me. Super important is your respect for your horse, for your team, your coach, your trainers, the vet, the blacksmith, your parents who cook your meals, drive you to the lessons, respect for yourself, having enough respect to show up and be present when you're being taught and be teachable too. This is a sport where you can continue to learn your entire life. Not one day has gone by that I haven't learned something about horse health or myself or care so also respect for the process of training. It is a process. And if you're not in love with the process, it's gonna be hard for you to excel because it's not always easy. And if you're a natural rider, there's gonna come a time in your career where you're gonna hit some slumps. And how you deal with those is gonna determine whether you have the fortitude and perseverance to continue on. It's all part, any person that's been in any sport for a long period of time has to deal with those times in their lives when they, <clears throat> their body changes or they don't have great horses. But you can still use those times as positive things to help you in the future. I also put in here, um, Respect for the process of growth, which includes this idea of failure. Um, like I said before, if you make a mistake or you don't win or it, you, it's a 
what you think is, oh my gosh, it's a disaster. It's actually going to be one of, <coughs> can be one of your greatest strengths. When I was younger, and I um, went with my first real trainer, Garden Walker, who's here in the room today. Garden trained this girl named Stacy Otto. And Stacy wore makeup. I wasn't allowed to wear makeup. She had a fancy horse. Oh, I, I did not have a good horse. And Stacy won all the time. Well, I decided that I hated it. It was upsetting to me. But it also gave me the impetus to start learning more about the mechanics of the horse, why horses do things. Um, and today, if it weren't for Stacy Otto, I may not be standing here today. So those times when you have those people that you feel like you're never gonna um, beat them in a class, they're gonna help you get where you need to go, even though at the time it really may not feel like it. Also, I want to, um, Lark Henry's in, in the audience too. I, um, I learned to ride at her uh, parents' Bob and Hollow farm. Her, her father taught me how to post. So it's really marvelous for me to be here. And uh, thank you all for those wonderful memories. Um, when I, I went to camp when I was seven, and the minimum age was nine, but I lived locally. So they let me come to camp figuring if I wanted to go home, my parents lived 20 minutes away, they'd come pick me up. Well, it was like a three week camp. I, I, the only time I rode home was when I would lose a tooth and I'd send the tooth home for the tooth fairy to send me money. <laughs> <laughs> but they had a horse named Cinnamon. And whenever I um, saw Cinnamon on the board that I had to ride Cinnamon, I would be like, oh no, not Cinnamon. Cinnamon was a park draft horse and she was, she was spotted and she hated to camp. So you know if you got cinnamon boy, oh. But you know, today I'm grateful for cinnamon. At the time it was like, oh no, please not cinnamon. But it's those times when you have those challenging horses that feel uncomfortable. It actually gives you good information about how to get things done, even if it's uh, some way to uh, maneuver around a problem or teaches you what kind of horse you don't like to ride or you won't excel at so that what, as you get older you can choose a better type of horse for your riding style. I was defeated for, I mean, I was rarely defeated on her, but 
I was in 1999, and I came back in 2000, and I won the World Run Championship again. There's, I can tell you a, a million times where failures have helped me, drive me, hone my skill. I um, sometimes show in a local show, and I remember I was uh, fourth one time, and I hung the ribbon up next, next to my bed so that every morning when I woke up, I'd see that fourth place ribbon. And I'd be like, do I, do I want to be a fourth place rider, or do I want to have the skill set to be a first place rider? And every day, you get up and you make a decision about how you're going to spend your time in pursuit of whatever your goal is. And for me, oops. for me that also includes a, a daily intention. So every day if you do something towards your goal, I, I use a, a variety of, of uh, tools. It's a, a, like a daily devotion, um, I, I try to connect with my horse. All these things are important. One of the, the um, things that there's no, <coughs> excuse me, no substitute for is riding. So ride as much as you can on as many different types of horses as you can. Mental training is extremely important. Tony's going to talk a little bit about that as well. But if you're physically strong, it's going to help your mind as well. And um, I love this book, Mind Gym. I highly recommend it. It's in our resource pamphlet that we're going to give to you later. Um, I use visualization a lot. I visualize the class. It doesn't always go that way. But if you're used to training in group lessons and you know your horse, you can make adjustments quickly, but you don't have to actually be thinking about it while you're competing. So that's, and I, I send that image to my horse as well. I tell, I visualize how I want that horse to look. Um, one of the things that, as I get older, I have a lot of trouble with is sleep, and it's super, super important. Your body can't metabolize fuel properly. Um, you won't be at your peak mental or physical level if you don't get enough sleep. And also, the kind of fuel that you put into your body um, is really important. I found out that I was like gluten intolerant, and I started eating through my blood type, and that helped me a lot. So, um, and of course, some form of daily devotion, and, and that's something that's important to me, and it, it can be whatever it is to each one of you, whether it's some connection with Mother Nature, or a prayer, or a meditation, some calming, centering, thing that you can do on a daily basis. And of equal importance, particularly as we get older, is physical fitness. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my coach, Tony Sandoval, who over the last two seasons has trained me to the World Grand Champion Fine Harness class, the Amateur World Champion of Championships, the Ladies World Champion of Championships, the Ladies World Champion Fine Gated Gelding, the Ladies World Champion Five Gated Mare and the Amateur Five Gated World Champion Mare, just in two years. So, Tony Sandoval, here he is. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to take a couple seconds to thank the AMHA and the NAAP. Look, I'm still learning all these acronyms. ASHA Youth for allowing me to come and speak to you guys this morning. So this morning, I mean, I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself, that way you get a little bit of my background. So I started off as a strength and conditioning coach in college. So I trained every sport that you can imagine that athletes play in college. Football, basketball, women's field hockey, men's and women's soccer, every sport. I did that for about 13 years. And Elizabeth just mentioned, I just been working with her for two. I did not know anything about horses. I'm from California, and I knew Kentucky was about horses, but I had no idea what, what I was getting into. And when we got introduced, I was looking at Elizabeth, and I went, all right, well, here we go. We got to figure out some things. We got to make this athlete better at what she did. And we've been very fortunate that we 
work very well together, we communicate, she follows instruction, or else, but she <laughs> follows instruction, and we, we've been grateful for, uh, more than anything, the friendship. So there's, there's, in the crowd, there's a lot of different types of athletes and age levels, so if I start losing some of you guys, I'm gonna look and see where I'm at. So if I give you this stare, don't worry, I'm not gonna make you do push-ups. It's just, I'm just trying to get a feel for the crowd and see where I can slow things down, speed things up. So here's what I'm gonna talk about. That way I don't get off the track. I've been known to, uh, as you say, fly the plane around and not ever to land. So I'm gonna try to make it really quick. The big three, I'm gonna talk about the benefits, now it's really tough to read, the benefits of physical preparation. You don't call it uh, personal training, uh, or anything like that, it's preparing you physically. I'm gonna talk about what I call the long-term developmental model, which I see a lot of young riders here, and I think this is very important for you guys to understand if you're trying to make this a career. And then what I call the GP3, that's Goth's Physical Preparation Plan, GP3. So we'll get started on the benefits of physical preparation training. So one of the first ones, is going to be to help reduce the risk of injury and also decrease the time of return to participation, RTP. So what does that mean? When I met Goth, she was telling me, and I had a notebook, all of the injuries that had come from being a question and athlete. And I mean, I think it was like a page and a half. And every I didn't skip any lines. And it was all kinds of things. And when I met her, she had a broken toe. So I already knew that she is not lying. So for me to, to tell you guys that training is not just what we see about fitting into our outfits better, it's actually to help you help reduce the risk of injury. I mean, you're on a huge horse. And again, I've never really seen any of these horses till I went to God's farm and I saw Bravo Blue and I just went, whoa, this is a huge horse, you want me to stick my hand out with a peppermint? No, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, I'll throw it and see if you can catch it. That was it. See what kind of an athlete is. But being strong, being fit, having good physical fitness has been shown to lower the, the likelihood of injury. This is a cool little graph that I got and it just basically says, we, if you use a lot of doctors, if you use a lot of physical therapists, but don't actually train yourself, if you're just popping medicine, that's not gonna be the answer. The answer is being fit. Now, uh, I see a lot of people, so here's, here's a question. How many of you guys actually have PE in school still? PE, great, put them down. Now, how many of you guys in this PE class play sports? Raise your hand. And put them down. So. How many of you guys in your PE class actually work on physical fitness? There's not a lot of hands. I think some people are like, I don't even know what that means, but sure, physical fitness it is. I'm not gonna throw my PE teacher under the bus. And down. Fitness level has gone down in the United States because that's one of the subjects that gets cut out. And as you get older and you don't have any physical fitness, and you compete in sports, that's where the likelihood of injury increases. So we wanna make sure that we do this. So I'm gonna show you a couple of slides here. Now, again, sorry if uh, you've never seen muscles like this before, but when people think of training, again, they think of more of the back. They think of, I wanna look fit. I wanna lose or gain muscle. Uh, I wanna lose fat. These pictures right here, what I'm trying to get a my point across is there's big muscles that work, glutes, gluteus maximus, back muscles that help support you, especially when you talk about posture. Can you go to the next one? And as we get going, there's actually a lot of small muscles that help you with your technique, with your form, that you never would know. And some of these muscles, can you get that? Uh, that way. Yep, one more. Yep, and some of those muscles you will never see. Physical preparation training allows us to tackle all these muscles that again, you'll never see through any of your outfits. You might not even ever feel. 
But if you look at some of these muscles, some of these guys right here, these all attach to your hip. I'm going to get too specific with these names. But if all these little guys right here are not working, you are going to be in some pain when you run. And you might not even know why. Right? So I want us to understand that when I talk about training, it's not so much big muscles and how I look. It's about can I perform my sport with great technique and can I do it healthy? So, I have, obviously this is the anatomy of a horse. Now, recently, working with another new client, figured out some things, just from listening to this person talk to me about her riding and some pain that this person is in. And I figured out that riders and their horse have an inverse relationship. What does that mean? So, if I were to talk to your horse vet, chiropractor, they would say, my horse has this going on on the right side. So something's going on, chiropractor's saying, this guy right here is out of place, some of these ribs, I don't know what's going on, this guy's messed up, all here. And then I talk to you, and you're saying, everything on my left side is hurting, and you're causing this horse to have pain on the right side. And I, again, two years in the game, I, I don't know much, but I know this, when I sit down in front of people and they tell me what's going on, I can always say, I am a horse, I'm an animal lover. So I'm more like, what's going on with you, horse? It's, I know you're hurting, but is your horse, horse okay? <laughs> can I go see him and pet him? I mean, that's, that's how I am, right? So I thought I'd throw this in there so you guys can understand. Fitness for you is, yes, it's important for you, but it's just as important for the health of your horse. Here's just some stats. Don't get scared. Areas of injury. Now it says head, 12%. I think we're talking about there is concussions. Look at the face, non-facial, neck. Now it says neck, zero, I don't know about that. Upper extremities, chest, abdomen, not too. People don't report it, but I'm sure there's some type of injury going on. But you can see that the huge one is upper extremities. So if you're not trained to get your upper body stronger, there's gonna be some issues. Again, this is probably for all my youth group people. How many of you guys do push-ups? Raise your hand. Now, how many of you guys know what a push-up is? All right, yeah, okay. Pull-ups, where are we at with pull-ups? Can you do it? Yeah. And down. So what this tells us is, if we are not strong enough for pull-ups and push-ups, the likelihood is going to get a lot higher that if you fall or something happens, you're going to have an upper body extremity injury. So we got to think about those things, right? That's, this is what I get from this. Is how, how do I train an athlete that rides horses? Look at the lower body extremities. Right? 59%. Uh oh, here's where God falls in, foot and toe. <laughs> and Improve stability. So I have obviously a picture of God here. Stability is where everything starts. Again, working with more riders, they talk about sitting. Now, where are you at, Melissa? Sitting deep into my saddle? Is that the correct term? Yes, sir. Sit deep inside the inside of your rack. Uh, your saddle, sorry. That all has to do with stability. So if you're trying to get coaching tips or cues to improve your form, but you're not physically able to do that, your form will never get better. But training helps with your stability so that all these coaching techniques will act. Well, you'll be able to do those things. Ah, yes. I am horrible at this. Improve flexibility and mobility. So when you are riding for a long 
time. You've been doing this for years. Things, muscles, start to what's called compensate, and they start getting tight in areas where they should not be tight. So with writing, where there's a lot of something that's going on called hip flexion. Obviously, right? Some of you of the level of hip flexion changes depending if you're a Morgan or if you're a saddle seat. Did I get that right, Melissa? Well, Close. Hunt seat and saddle seat. I was, I was getting taught again about the lengths of stirrups and what is going on with the limb lengths and knee bend and how you sit. And I'm just looking at this going, this is all great information for me to try to regurgitate. Again, I'm not an expert, but I know this. I know the body. I know that very well. And if, if you're sitting down for a long time, these little guys get tight. Hip flexors get tight. There's a couple other muscles here that are associated with that, but they start pulling, if you can see here, they start pulling on your back, they start pulling on your hip. After a while, you can't even get out of bed without making some type of pain noise. So we have to make sure that we keep flexible and mobile. Flexible and mobile. Increase your cardiovascular system. So we'll get into some techie stuff here in a little bit. I don't want to bore anybody. But being physically fit also means your heart has to be physically fit. The heart pumps blood to your body. If the heart stops, muscles are uh, stop pumping blood, then you, your muscles are not going to really feel good when you train. Some of us feel that burn sensation or you, your legs start shaking when you train, all that. Is not only just muscular endurance, but we have to work on our heart, cardiovascular endurance. These are just some, some things that I have got to do. We train with a heart rate monitor. That way I know when she's training hard, what's actually going with her heart? Am I pushing her hard enough? Because if I ask her, is this hard? She'll say, oh, it's so hard. But then I'll look at the monitor, and blue means easy. And look at that. Oh, is this a good training set? Oh, it's the worst. But then I look at her heart, I'm going, oh yeah, let's get working now. Let's go over here to the red area. And see, uh, this was actually more of a, it was a heart trend, very low level, and I planned it like that. So this was actually a great graph to show you that it doesn't always have to be intense, it just has to be movement. And so you'll see right here, this was, she put on her heart rate monitor, we did some light work. So I get to see these things, but it's all about training the whole body, not just muscles, not just flexibility, but other things as well. So this one uh, is gonna be a little tough for me to explain. I'm trying to simplify this here. Coordination and skill acquisition. Raise your hand if you know what skill acquisition might mean. Skill acquisition. Great, great, all right. So here's what we're gonna do. When you train, when you train, well, I'll say this, let me ask you another question. How many of you guys played some other sport? Soccer, football, basketball, great, down. I'll say this, the more sports you play, the better athlete you're gonna be. The better athlete. Now, the reason I ask that question is because the skill of acquiring better techniques to ride horses all depends on how often you have to do it. If you're always trying to learn exercises, if you're always trying to uh, get fit, your body remembers those things, and when you're not good at a certain exercise, at, although you hate it, your body's learning, like a, it's a, it has a huge computer up here that'll start learning really fast, and it'll make you better at learning different skills. So the more sports you play that you're not good at, that's great, get good at it. And then when you come and start riding horses, when you start getting coached up, guess what the body does or the brain? It'll start picking up all of these sensations and start making you learn quicker. So physical fitness is not just here, it's in your brain and how fast you learn things. Just imagine, if you were riding and your coach said, do this, and you were said, yes sir, and boom, the answer was there. We were better. It doesn't work out like that, but being in that training mode helps your body improve that. Did that make sense? Yes, 
Yes, and nods and heads. Okay, I didn't do so bad. This is a big one, and I think uh, God looted it a little bit. We work a lot with the psychological effect. So here's some more questions, so I don't lose you. How many of you guys, before a competition, get butterflies in your stomach? Down. How many of you guys don't get nervous, just you're ready to roll, you're out there, you're a beast? Down. All right. Good, good, good. What we try to train athletes with, with that is it is okay and perfectly normal for you to have butterflies. Have a little bit, now, don't get scared here. Have a little bit of fear. There's a little part in your brain that its job is to help you stay alive. And when you start getting a little bit nervous, fear, butterflies, that's your, that little part, it's doing its job to tell you, don't do that. Our job is not to do these things, our job is to stay alive. This might not help us. But, but, what we try to talk about is, if your brain is telling you to do that, you're headed in the right direction. Fear is not something that you should not say it's not happening, I don't get afraid, you use fear. You use fear to build confidence that you're doing the right thing. You're supposed to be at that competition. You've trained well. You're prepared. But it will always be there. And in football, trust me, I'm in locker rooms where there's no fear. Shirts that say no fear. It is impossible to have no fear. There's a little part of your brain that its job is to tell you there is fear here. And it's your job as an athlete, the more trained you are, to say, I, I know that brain, but I'm still going to do this because I'm prepared. And, and this graph just shows you that there's per different personalities and how you handle yourself. Great thing to do is just to be talk to a lot of athletes at your competition. You start to get to know them, see where their mind's at, how are you, are you shy? Are you outgoing? All that stuff plays into how you see competition. And the stronger you are up here, the better you're gonna perform. So I don't want anybody to think, well, if I'm nervous, I'm not mentally strong. I'm the opposite. You're actually very strong. You just have to train yourself to get through that fear and then go and perform. Yes? Are you talking about the If you had this mic, I'd have you drop it because that's exactly what I am talking about. How did you know that? I would have never guessed. I didn't even mention it. Yes, I am talking about the amygdala. Yes, they call that the lizard part of the brain. I don't know why, but they call that the lizard brain. So, does everybody understand? That just made my morning right there, that you knew the amygdala. I don't know if your school's teaching PE, but they got the signs down packed. But there's, again, for me, the, a psychological advantage is making sure that if you look at this guy right here, that you have great people around you to help you with understanding how you see performance, good events that you have, and then like uh, Elizabeth mentioned, when you have bad performances, how to learn from those. You have all these types of envi environments that you get into, sporting events, what are your training environments like, the competition, how do you view that competition? Is it, do you get excited, do you get nervous? Again, the psychological model is something that we always work on no matter what age of athlete you are at, training age or just age in general. It's always going to be a process, and as long as you guys understand it's all about getting yourself better, then you're gonna be on the right track. All right, long-term development model. I think I put this up because I knew I was gonna be talking to some of you. So I wanted to get you guys to understand. So, it's a process. Elizabeth also mentioned that, and for me, when I'm training youth, I always talk about how am I gonna build a foundation? If you build a great foundation and you introduce a lot of different exercises and make you a better athlete, you're gonna have a strong, what's called structure. And you can't see what's on those, those blocks, but it, it, it says things like being able to have great mobility, stability, flexibility. You're, you can move well, that's good structure. Then we get into the strength component. The strength component, now we start talking about how our muscles are, are coordinating 
to make things happen. What do I mean by that? Well, if I am trying to stabilize myself, the stronger my legs are, the more coordinated they'll be to keep me in a good position. And then we start talking about as you get older, not just in age, but again, in what I call training age. How long have you been training? Then we start getting into performance. And I think a lot of us in here might have thought sports performance has to be sports specific. And I'll get to that, to, to that in a little bit. But for my, my job is to get you from the structure, the basics, to strength. Can you handle some type of load on your body? And, and equestrian sports is very difficult because you have an animal that you have to consider. And then performance. How is this all going to lead into greater performance? It's not just fitness, guys. And I keep repeating that because I want you to understand, if you're doing physical fitness or any type of physical preparation training, it, has, it, it is going to be for performance. All right, so now we're gonna talk about what Goff and I do. And it's again, the three keys are gonna be physical preparation plan. So, yep. This is not what we do. A lot of people would think physical fitness for equestrian sport, we have to make it very sport specific. We are gonna juggle medicine balls on a stability ball like that, or better yet, this is actually pretty smart. I can see where they were going with this. They put, this is an exercise, what we call a stability ball. And I'm sure this is some type of contraption to stimulate or simulate putting a saddle on and trying to gain stability, but this is not what I would train in. The, the best way to be sport specific is to do the thing that you're trying to do. If I'm trying to be a better basketball player and I need to improve my shooting ability, guess what I'm gonna do? If I am trying to improve anything in your sport, now again, I'm not gonna even throw myself out there and think I know any type of skill acquisition that you guys do, but you do that. You do that. Next one. Okay, so probably a lot of people have seen this. Uh, doing some type of training and again using modalities like this to try to improve stability. But I'll tell you what, if this person is not strong, this isn't gonna work. If the little muscles in here and the little muscles in here and up her back are not strong, it's not gonna work. This looks cool, I'll say that, but it doesn't work long term. So we want to be careful when we talk about sports specific. We really do. What we like to do is make sure that we go from a general non-sports specific type of training. That's why I asked you guys, how many of us play other sports? It has to be broad, have fun training. And then from there we create our stability and mobility, and you can see just up the line how we have to do these things to actually get to a sport specific and things that mimic the game. But one thing that I always see is that people like to go from here to here really quick. And you see it on YouTube, you see it on Instagram, all these cool exercises. And if you follow anybody that is in your sport and they're training a certain way and you think you can do that, I would say that is incorrect. There's a process. You're seeing the result, right? You're seeing that what it should look like, but it's, it, you have to consider it's gonna take some time for you to get there. So here are some things that we do. The first thing that we do is I have, I have to make sure that I plan God's whole year. It's a year plan. Everything. Everything that we do from when we she stops the competition phase all the way to start up. I work on a couple things here. What I call the five primal movements. We're gonna push, pull, squat, hinge, carry something heavy, and push something heavy. I'll get some pictures of that so you guys know what I'm talking about. We do a little bit of cardiovascular fitness. We sprint a lot. We do some jogs. Um, Elizabeth has some awesome dogs that I ask her to walk as part of exercise. That's my best exercise. And then we have some recovery. Have some days that we are gonna train hard and then have some days that we're going to take it easy. And let me get into that really fast here. Oh, I'm starting with that, okay? Good. Yes.
Yes, that's the second part. Yes, everybody comes in to, with me with different needs. So we take them through an analysis, and I say we as myself and a physical therapist that I work with, and then we figure out when's your competition date, what are you trying to accomplish, are you with pain or pain-free, and then from there we make a game plan. But there is a plan, and it is a year-long thing. And if it's, we start with short-term goals, and then from those short-term goals, we work our way there. And if it's really close to competition, we tell the person, these are the realistic things that we're gonna get. But we try to address, most of the times, it's gonna be, I have pain. I can't do something because there's pain. Oh yeah, and I'm probably a little bit uh, out of shape, so that'd be great as well, if you could work on that. So it is individual. So, pulling. Pulling exercises are gonna strengthen everything in the backside of your body. And that is what helps your sport create your stability that you need to be able to get in and stay into the positions you need to get. So, Goth and I, we do exercises like pull things off the floor. We use our back muscles and it creates stability in our back so that we can do things that she needs to do to stay healthy while she rides. We'll pull, this is a cool exercise that I have to do, a trap bar deadlift. So, I, have, I find ways to motivate people. And one of the things that I did with Goth was to say, we are going to do a certain amount of weight. For her, it was body weight and a half. Body weight and a half. But we're gonna do it in one session, the same amount in pounds as one of your horses. So within one session, if she had a horse, what did we say probably, 1,200? Boomer, yeah, 1,200 pounds. We do as many sets and reps as it took to get 1,200 pounds. Just to motivate, just to, it's, it's hard work lifting heavy weights. It is not fun. As you can see, with, with Goth in, in her pictures, it's not like she's a bodybuilder, but we needed strength. Strength so I could keep her healthy. And it was just a cool thing that we did to say, well, let's just train to lift one of your horses. We also did, and this one was cut out, an insane amount of pull-ups. And I asked everybody how many pull-ups can anyone do, or if you did them at all. And Goth and I got to a point where we were knocking out probably about 60 pull-ups every session. And we had a ton of sessions. So I would say in a week, it'd be somewhere over 100 pull-ups. Why? That way she could control those huge animals that I see in the stalls. So I, pulling is super important. Push. Not just push upper body like a push up, but push away from the floor. It's a primal movement that we do. When you're walking, you're actually pushing yourself forward. When you're running, you're pushing yourself forward. You see Goth over here, she's got what we call bunnies. She's getting off the floor a little bit. We jump on the bar, so I, was, I needed her to create power and to push hard off the floor so she could jump. We did things like step ups to help her not only improve her balance and stability, but also single leg strength. Upper body wise, we did things like pushing some type of resistance. In this picture, it's some tubes to increase her upper body strength. She pushed, sometimes our, uh, we would be in a situation where I figured that today was a good day to instead of squatting or doing something very difficult uh, on the knees, that we would do a, a leg press instead. That way I could keep her safe. And there are the push-ups. Being strong is super important, more than anything when you're trying to get fit. So this was, these two, last two slides was just a way for us to get there. There's plenty of other ways, but for God's situation, this was the best way. We did things, again, like squats, and we used modalities like TRX suspension training, if you guys don't know what that is. It just allows us to, it allows us to have some body weight exercises that she can control on days where she may have not gotten good sleep the night before. On days that she came back from traveling and her body didn't feel like training, we did, we did training and it was still hard, but it was with the right exercises. Yes? Oh, perfect, <laughs> perfect. 
hinging. So this exercise is called the kettlebell hip swing. And the purpose of this was to strengthen Gough's hamstrings, her hips, and her, what we call erectors, right here in her spine. That way she can handle a lot of volume of training. My job was to keep her safe, improve her fitness by making her healthy enough and strong enough to practice for a long time. Because the practice is what was gonna make her better. Do you guys agree? More practice? Yes? Doing this probably directly was not gonna make her a better athlete. But indirectly, it was gonna give her the ability to practice more, and that's what makes you a better rider. She loved this. She loved this. We pushed that sled around the track, and oh, I wish I could record the sound bites to that, because that would have been awesome. That would have been awesome. It's fun. It gives us a, a little break in training, but pushing things is something very primal. People used to do that before they had any other ways to get things from point A to point B. We also carry heavy things, and I didn't get a picture of that, but we pick up heavy things and we'll just walk around, and I'll say things like, pretend this is a 50 pound suitcase, your wheel just broke, and you gotta carry it with one arm and walk it for about 300 yards, 200 yards, 100 yards. Those strengthened muscles that were going to be needed for her to ride. So I love this. And again, for us, we wanted to have something fun. Fun. If you're not having fun when you're doing any of this, then it's a drag. And when, you, and when you're dragging on something, you're probably not going to get the most out of it. Okay, so here's, here's some of the things that we did on the science side. How many of you guys like science? Technology. Yeah, I know you do. Te technology. Now we're in an age where everybody can read something. I don't know if you guys use techno technology on your horses and what type of technology you guys do, but we use technology to make sure that Goth was always at her optimal readiness to train. So I use a company called Omega Wave, and Omega Wave would tell me all types of things about what was going on with Goth. Go through this again, it's trying to be not as boring as possible. So this thing, this thing here would tell us, number one, her readiness to train between one and seven, where is she this today? That would give me an idea, according to my plan, how I was going to train her. Imagine that. It's not just what exercises, but how much weight. Is she feeling very energetic or not? So these things would tell us endurance. Yup, we can work on endurance. Speed and power. Moving things fast. Mm, we could, but it won't be optimal. Strength. Yes. God, you know we're lifting heavy weights today. You're ready to roll. Coordination and skill. If you have a lot of stress, like I forgot to do my homework, if you don't get a lot of sleep, uh, if you're having arguments with your friends on Instagram and somebody posted something that you hated and you didn't like it and now it's stressing you out, Guess what, the next day this thing would tell me your coordination and skill is low because you're very stressed. That might not be a best, the best day to teach you a new exercise. That might be a day where maybe in practice, you're not doing things that you're really trying to get better at. You're working on things that you're really good at and just trying to get better at that. So we use Omega Wave to specify and make it very targeted as far as our training was concerned. We use something called Headspace as far as our psychological training. It's a cool app. You download it on your phone and it lets you go through about five minutes to ten minutes a day of learning how to meditate. When somebody says relax, focus, most people don't know what that actually means. Focus. Uh, okay, or what? For how long? What about if I, am I not cool if I don't even know what that means? I don't know what that means, but how do I do it? This allows you and teaches you how to focus. Teaches you how to focus, which was awesome for us at first to be able to learn how to sit down, relax every day. Okay, this is what my day is gonna look like. All right, now let's go again. So I, lo I love this app for that. It's super easy to use. Oh, there were some challenges. 
that we had overcome with our with our training, and I wanted to make sure that you guys understand it's not just awesome every day, right? There was always coming in where Elizabeth would have some type of pain, some type some type of uh, you know incident that happened maybe in training or with the travels. There was things that we had to overcome. Stress. Everybody has stress at some point. It was our job to try to alleviate that stress and work through it. And obviously there's a, a work-life balance. And I loved it when she went on vacations and, and, and made sure that she was recovering physically, that she hung out with friends, spent some time with her family. All of that is part of training. It's not just the triangle that I showed you guys and every day we're training hard. No, it's a balance that we did. And, but we planned for all of that. That we would have some great success. So, how do you get started? Well, here are some people that if you wanted to look into physical fitness trainers, you would look for a couple things. The first one is what's called a CSCS. That's what I have. It's from the association called National Strength and Conditioning Association. For, that, for you to get that cert, you have to have a four-year degree at least and be able to pass a very tough test. The next one after that, I think this one is a lot more common, is a NS, uh, NASM certified, but a performance enhancement specialist. So they do have some training in how to actually improve somebody's performance. Um, and I know a lot of great guys that have this. And then this is one that I see here and there, American College of Sports Medicine. They take a more of a clinical approach, but great people as far as learning how to actually plan. It's not, you know, come in and let's see what exercise I have for you. They actually take their time and try to create a good program for you. And I think what we're going to do now is we're going to give it back to Elizabeth so she can wrap this up. Um, and I'll make sure that at the end I make myself available for any questions. Thank you. component is more than just physical and it helps with the outcome. However, we're in a subjective sport. So if your goal is to win, you might want to rethink that and make your goal a more positive goal that's tied less to an outcome but more to an ability or a skill level. You'll be a much happier person uh, if, if you make your goals about skill acquisition, improving things, things like that. And like Tony said, there, there is no substitute for riding. And success happens when hard work meets opportunity. And when you put all of these components together, the love, the devotion, the physical components, the mental components, and your connection with the horse, and you have those moments in the show ring, you have rare opportunities to have this magic happen. And it doesn't happen very often, and it's one of the reasons why I still am interested in it is finding that connection to my horse and having the skill and not being the weak link so that I can show in the kind of classes that I want to compete in on the types of horses that I want to compete with. I don't ever want to be the weak link and I want to have a bond with my horse. It's like that movie Avatar where you see them connect their braid to their dragon. It's that same kind of feeling and there's just nothing like it. And to me, it is magical. And it's when people see those great performances, what they're seeing is that connection between you and your horse. And it is like magic. And it's just one of the most glorious experiences I've ever had. And it doesn't come easily. And it doesn't come without all of the components that I've talked about. So I want to thank you all for having Tony and me here today. And um, Tony is available for questions. So I'll just be pointing around.
around. If you have any questions, by all means. Yes. Yes. So that's a great question. Um, so her question, I don't know if you, everyone heard it, is have some physical things going on, scoliosis, and I am seeing that not only transfer to my horse, but I'm also riding with pain. This is how we. This is how I do. It. I have the ability to have an in-house physical therapist, and we sit down with people and we figure out a plan on what we can do to improve your level of comfort and pain-free training. And then we come up with a plan on, depending on what type of probably rider you are, how long you've been doing it, even bringing in a coach and for us to understand what's going on with your training while you're riding, right? And then from there saying, okay, these are the things that might happen. But I always have a physical therapist there because they're more skilled than I am at that clinical part. And then we come up with a plan as far as exercises that you need. Some may be at home, some may be at, at training with us, but we come up together. It's not just exercises at our place, it's the holistic approach. How are, how are you living as far as pain-wise? So he takes care of that. And then we talk together to, again, come up with a solution as far as long-term so that you can first be pain-free, and then we can talk about paid performance on our right. So some therapists are very sports oriented, and I would say go to a physical therapist that is that physic that is sports oriented. Some of them handle more occupational pain, you know, uh, have uh, arthritis here or they have carpal tunnel, and, and they still may be able to help you. But when you go to people that do sports physical therapy, they have a passion for that, so they, they would be willing to not even help you but recommend you to another trainer. Yeah, uh, she brings up a good point. I have another athlete that I write, she's a, an inventor. And she uh, started it late as well. And she is deaf in one ear, um, so she can't stabilize in the other ear. And she's been falling off her horse, and the things that we've been doing with her is, I give her a lot of training to have sensation on the other side. So that way she can learn how to feel things different. And then she's made so much stride in her technique. I also train her trainer, and she comes in and says, night and day, not only with her, but when I train her horse when she's not there, it's, well, it's performing better, the horses, because she's managing it better.
and that takes a little while. It's like I always joke in the winter, like I'm gonna write a book from the couch to the winter circle. <laughs> because I'm, you know, 54, and I have had a uh, broke C1 in two places. I have a bulging disc between five and six, patella tracking problems, uh, broke my foot, broke my arm. There's some issues that we deal with, and I like to take some time off. I really do. I, I want to eat a pizza and go to basket and run it. <laughs> and just play around, you know, not ride and have it be such an intense thing all the time. And uh, Tony really helps in, when I'm coming back in. And I always sometimes complain, I'm like, coach, it's funny. And he's like, no, we, you know, we're just creating those pathways. And, and it's true because uh, when he'll give me these little exercises and I think it's easy, I actually can't do it. <laughs> so it's yeah. Did you have? It's more of a, a Tommy you talk about. Okay. Yes. Um, my question is why everybody comes to a personal trainer? Is there any literature or um, like books or something that we can read that we can do that you can help us improve without having that cost personal training? Great question. So, Goth created this pamphlet, and I would encourage everybody to come up at some point to get this, and it has some at-home exercises that I put on here that are very easy, um, but there's, I didn't put every picture, but I put the names down, and if you go to YouTube and just punching these names, you'll have a, a ton of videos, and it's a rabbit hole, because once you get one video, then you click on the next one, and the next one, and before you know it, you're up here speaking about how you got it dialed in using YouTube. So I would say YouTube and, and then this list of exercises that are step one of creating stability. Uh, that, so I made that accessible here. Your, con your contact information. Yes, uh, I, have, I brought cards so that everybody can get one who, who wants one. That way you can ask me questions if you think of any later down the line. Any other questions? Yes. So, great question, I love it, I love it, yes, yes. So, there are, there's a couple of different factors with strengthening the prefrontal cortex. So there are other structures in the brain that, that work together with the prefrontal cortex, but to answer, answer it simply, yes it does, it just takes a lot of work for you to do it, because your brain has to learn what you're doing before it gets to this. Does that make sense? Yes, but it does. <laughs> Smart person. Smart person. Talk about when you compete, that you're, you're actually not using it though. By the time you've trained enough to show that you have So, Elizabeth brings up a good point. Although, meditating and getting your brain to slow down when you're competing is really important. I'm sure everybody here knows that when you're in that ring, it's almost like it's, everybody's gone. It's all blank. And all you do is react. All you do is go through what's probably your um, muscle memory, reactive movements that don't take any thinking. But in order for that to happen, yes, you do have to have a level of mental strength for it to really, really work. So I competed when I was younger, since I was five, in boxing and you're in the middle of a ring and there's tons of people watching you. When you get in that ring, it's just you and that other person, it's everybody is gone. Probably the same for you guys, I would imagine, when everybody's looking at you. Yeah. Any other questions? It's kind of a weird one, but everything that I do physically counter is counteracted by sitting too much time at a desk. Mm -hmm. So what about a standing desk situation? Is that a better situation for those of us that can't get away from a desk? So I also work with a lot of uh, professionals that they do sit down and they tell me they buy different type of balls with wheels, that way they can sit down on a stability ball. I think the best one that I've heard so far, and it is backed by science from occupational therapists, getting up every hour and just to walk around will help alleviate that. That's the, probably the best one that has some science behind it. Everything else is very personal. You know, I'm gonna get up and stretch, I'm gonna go get some water, 
but I think what they, uh, in one office, in one law firm, they make it mandatory. You cannot sit at your desk for more than an hour. Mandatory. Yes, bye. That's a good question. I think that when you when you get to practice, something that you should do is do a warm up. So if you're sore from doing exercise, then you should definitely do some stretching, some something that gets you ready. I'm sure the, your horse does the same thing. He just doesn't get walked out and then all right, saddle that. Here you go. You're on there. I think he goes to maybe a warm up. He gets nice and sweaty and then he's ready. Right? I think you need to do the same thing is just think about what are some exercises that I can do to stretch. And again, I didn't bring any of that with me, but uh, you could put warm up exercises on YouTube and have fun trying to figure out what works for you best. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> What that that's what type of injury did you have? Uh, well, no, I don't have an injury, but it's, I'm just saying I have a concussion. I'm just saying Now the science on concussion is still always changing. In in football, there's so many protocols that people have, and I don't know if your governing association has any protocol protocols for concussion. But according to their policies. There are certain timelines that we have to stay by as far as letting your brain heal before we do any training. Once you have passed your test and you're clear to train, then there's, if you're prone to having concussions, then there's several neck strengthening exercises. Again, it becomes very, very specific to the rider, what type of injury they have, and getting their history before we can say, this is how we're gonna train. Yes, my friend? What's your name? So, I mean, you're always asking questions. I'm Caroline. Caroline. Did they give you a humidifier? Uh, I think we've had, I've had athletes that were like that before and our trainers would give them, a, or ask them to do a humidifier and to practice big, deep breathing. Another thing that you should do to strengthen your lungs is take a yoga class. Why a yoga class? Because they teach you how to breathe. They'll teach you cadences on how to breathe and how to do what's called, I think what you need to get really good at, is called diaphragm breathing. Where your lungs actually start working a lot more because your diaphragm is pushing all the air up to your chest and it's allowing them to expand in your rib cage and come back down. So I would say, do a little research on diaphragm breathing. You know where your diaphragm is at, right? Yes, diaphragm breathing, and then that should give you a lot more tips on how to strengthen your lungs. Any other questions? So if you, anybody does have any questions uh, and wants to get a hold of me, Please do, I have my cards up here. I have both my card and my physical therapist that I work with, his card, we work in the same place. Again, anytime, I will try to answer emails as fast as I get them. Thank you very much again for having us here.